happy merry holly jolly season's greetings here like the popular animated snowman olaf if i were to go around asking what's your favorite family tradition around this time of year what would your answers be christmas trees wreaths and mistletoe rum cakes rose cookies and dodol caroling from door to door and parties with gifts galore no doubt all this fills us with excitement but even if christmas is stripped bare of all its traditions the bible says that the first christmas was all about announcing the gospel or the good news that god came down as man to save the world from sin i'm reading from the book of luke chapter 2 verses 10 to 12 but the angel said to them do not be afraid I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. So remember to enjoy Christmas the way you want to, but why not uh become an instrument to spread the good news too. Share it with everyone that needs to hear that to defeat sin, death and decay. Our savior Jesus Christ is here. Let us pray. Dear God, help us all to know and celebrate the truth about Christ this Christmas. Along with Christmas cheer, help us to spread the good news too. I ask you to bless the rest of the service such that it touches our hearts. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Joy to the world the Lord is come let earth receive a king let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature say Yeah.
just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot to Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome pardon, cleanse, relieve, because thy promise I Brothers and sisters, now is the time of communion. Let's open up our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. If I were to make you the clinking sound of keys, you would be puzzled and would ask me why I am making you hear that sound. It wouldn't make much sense to you. But for a prisoner who is in jail for the rest of his life, that same sound would be a sound of hope. And when that prisoner sees that the man carrying the keys is coming to his cell, that hope would turn into overwhelming joy. In a similar way to a man who is ignorant to his own sin and the fact that the wrath of God abides in him for the lifetime of iniquities that he has committed, the sound of the gospel holds no value. It will even seem something foolish to him. But for a man who has been convicted of the Holy Spirit about his sin, the sound of gospel will be something that would bring hope and overwhelming joy. To a man who knows how wretched he is and what his sins deserve, the words that Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring him to God would be the sweetest words that he will ever listen. Most of us listening to me right now know how precious did that grace appear the hour we first believed. But sadly, some of us have forgotten the same message. And even worse is that for some of us, sin has hardened our hearts so much that the gospel doesn't make any difference to us. But for some of us, when we hear the message, even today, it makes us overwhelmingly joyful. So where are you this morning? No matter wherever you are, God has given us this time of communion in order to remind us that same gospel message. To remind us what he has done for us through Christ his son. And he gives us the opportunity to turn back to him again and to experience that overwhelming joy in our heart yet again in his presence. The question is, will you partake in it with all your heart, soul, mind and strength? Or will you just go through the motions and treat this time as some kind of a Sunday ritual? I pray that the Holy Spirit will rejuvenate us once again with the Gospel this morning. The bread that we are about to eat represents Christ's body and the grape juice represents His blood. Let us pray for the coming. God our loving Father, we thank you for everything that you have done in our life. As we receive this bread and grape juice, help us to understand your love for us. Help us to understand the price that you paid for us and help us to value that sacrifice.
lives. Be with us, Lord, as we need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here ends the time of communion and now is the time of contribution. The gospel message essentially is where the Lord has given us the best he had in heaven in order to save us from our sin. And contribution is the time where we are called to give the best that we can in order to help our brothers and sisters in need. Let us this morning imitate our Lord in his generosity, striving to become more and more like Jesus. Let us pray for the contribution. God our loving Father, you have always blessed us and made sure that our needs have been taken care of. We thank you for your faithfulness. At this time of giving, be with us and help us to give cheerfully. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I thank you all for tuning into our Sunday podcast service. An interesting statistic for you. This is our 91st podcast ever since we went into lockdown in March 2020. And I do hope that the situation will change in 2022. December is normally a month of peace goodwill towards one another and celebrating Christmas. But instead, we see hatred in many places, you know, between countries, communities, families, where relationships and bonds are torn apart. Unity has become a very rare thing to be seen. And sadly, it's the same when it comes to the church. You know, if you were to go on social media, you would find a great number of self-professing Christians fighting with each other in a rather rude manner. The Lord Jesus prayed for his followers to be united, to be one, you know, in John chapter 17. So it is very sad to see that there are so many fragmented groups which are disunited, but all the same professing to be followers of Christ. Last Sunday, we saw how we were made in the image of God and how we were called to reflect the image of God to the world. But pride can bring us down. And what's the opposite of pride? It's humility. And today, we'll be diving deeper into this as we go through a passage that displays to us the ultimate example of humility. If all the churches were to practice this virtue, It would serve to help in uniting them all. This morning, we'll be looking into the first 11 verses of Philippians chapter 2. And the title that I've given the sermon is The Matchless Humility of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, before we move ahead, let me just say this, that here is the burden of the preacher. You know, I've been working on this message for the last two weeks. And I don't know how many hours I've spent on researching, reading, meditating and praying on this passage. And I'm not saying this to show you how hard I've worked. But I want you to know that this is a majestic passage of scripture. It is overwhelming and deep. And I feel that no matter what I say today, it will fall short of what this text is worthy of. And this is my prayer this morning for us, brothers and sisters, 
that we will have a more exalted view of Christ by the end of the sermon. That the Lord Jesus will be lifted up in our eyes in ways that we've never seen him and that we would follow his example. The passage that we are about to cover this morning talks about the humility and humiliation of Jesus Christ. No other passage in the Bible is as complete and detailed in its presentation of the great miracle of God becoming man. In fact, as you read through this text, the incarnation of Christ from heaven to earth is given in a series of steps. It is as if the Spirit of God wants you to follow the drama, you know, at a pace that builds up and mounts to a climax so that you can understand what Christ did for us. And it's a very deep passage, you know, with a crucial theological significance. But surprisingly, Paul's motives in these words are not really theological in nature. He's not writing this to explain the theology of the Incarnation for us to know and understand the doctrine. No, no, no. But rather, his purpose is ethical. He's writing this in a pastoral way. You know, these verses present the truth that the Son of God came to earth as a man to save sinners through his death and resurrection. And then we'll see how he was exalted again back to heaven. That in itself is the heart and soul of Christian theology. But the main point here is not to explain to us the saving work of the Lord Jesus. But rather, Paul is writing these words so that he can present to us the Lord Jesus as a model of humility, a model of self-denying, self-giving, humble love. But before Paul gives us the example of the Lord, he shares about what is expected from followers of Christ. Let's open up our Bibles to Philippians chapter 2 and we read verses 1 to 2. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. You know, so Paul here is saying that in a world filled with division and in which pride is everywhere, our lives as Christians are to be marked by humility. And how can our lives be marked by humility? By constantly reminding ourselves and by considering all that has been done for us in Christ Jesus. So what are the things that causes a man to be humble? Paul specifies four things. The first, the encouragement that we have received in Christ. You know, that we've been made heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. You know, that's super encouraging words for us to hear, right? That we are heirs of God. We are partakers in his inheritance. And what's the second thing? Consolation of love. That though we were enemies of God, he chose to love us anyway and he demonstrated that through the death of of his son on that cross. That's the consolation of love that we've received. The third thing, the fellowship of the Spirit. That not only did he send his son to die for us on the cross, but he has sealed us in Christ by making our bodies the temple of his Holy Spirit. That we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us as a seal said by God. How cool is that? We have the fellowship of the Spirit. The fourth thing, affection and compassion. That because of all these things, we've been made sons and daughters of the Heavenly King. God has shown His affection towards us, His compassion towards us by adopting us as His own children in Christ. 
and Jesus is our brother. You know, Paul is asking us to remind ourselves of these things. Why? Because when we are constantly reminded of what the Lord Jesus has done for us, it helps us to keep us humble, to live a life of humility. Brothers and sisters, we are not as great as we think we are. In fact, we were vile and disgusting before the eyes of God. Even our good works were like filthy rags before Him. But God showed mercy towards us and He saved us. And that shows us that the only great person in this room is God. And that reality should fill us with gratitude, which in turn is acted out with humility. Brothers and sisters, you and I are not as important as we think we are. You know how I can say that? Because we will die tomorrow and the world will still keep on spinning. Not a single thing will change. Do you see what I mean? But the beauty of our God is that yet the gospel came to us. So Paul has given us reasons of why we should be humble. But then Paul goes on to share what humility acted out looks like. Let's read verses 3 and 4. He says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So what causes us to be humble? The fact that we are not the center of the universe, but God still has extended his love towards us. And what follows after humility? That we do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, we regard one another as more important than ourselves. Not merely looking out for our own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. This is humility in action, brothers and sisters. That we consider others better than ourselves. And when we will start to live that out, brothers and sisters, the global church of believers that is so divided today will be bound by unity, together in one spirit. And brothers and sisters, Paul could have just stopped here, you know, He has told us what we need to do as Christians, how we need to live with humility. He has made his point, right? But no, he doesn't stop there. But he goes on to give us the ultimate example of humility. The Lord Jesus Christ. So how is the Lord Jesus the ultimate example of humility? First, we are shown his humility in his birth. When our Lord Jesus came into this world, he came humbly. He was born in a stable. Think about it. The Son of God, born in a stable. How many of you would like your child to be born in a stable? None of us would want that, right? But he was born and laid in a manger. You know, a feeding place for animals. He lived in a very insignificant town called Nazareth. He was born into a very common family of no particular importance. Now, brothers and sisters, if I were God and I was planning to come down to earth, I would come down with all my majesty and splendor and you would know that I am God and you would bow down before me with fear. But our God is a humble God. He chose to be born in a smelly manger, unhygienic even, to a very poor family. And not just in his birth, but we also see the Lord's humility in his earthly life. We are told by the gospel accounts that his whole life was a life that was defined by humility. He said he had nowhere to lay his head. You know, no five-star hotels or personal drivers to take him from one place to another. No, no, no. He walked on foot. 
he felt thirsty he was tired he was sleepy he lived his ministry life out on the roads sleeping you know wherever he could with his disciples spending many nights in the outdoors what kind of a god would do this would you choose to do this if you were god but our god is a humble god our god had no home he had basically just the clothes on his back and a bunch of followers and this is a part of his humiliation this is all humiliating for him brothers and sisters this is the son of god that we are talking about the king of glory the king of kings the word of god the prince of peace the one who is the head over all things the son of god he is god but here is his humility here is his humility now let's read the meat of this passage let's open up our bibles to philippians chapter 2 and we read verses 5 to 8 and this is really important brothers and sisters listen carefully paul says this have this attitude in yourselves which was also in christ jesus who although he existed in the form of god did not regard equality with god a thing to be grasped but emptied himself taking the form of a born servant and being made in the likeness of men being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross do you see his humility brothers and sisters and as i have already mentioned before that the holy spirit through paul describes the incarnation of the lord in a series of steps and you can say that these steps in a way are the steps to his humiliation so let's dive deeper this morning and let's look into those steps one by one and this is the first step the deity of christ Paul says have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus who although he existed in the form of God you know Paul is basically reminding us here that hey in case you've forgotten this man that we are talking about he is God Okay he's not just some random guy walking down the street he is the creator god who had no beginning he is the eternal god just as it is said in Isaiah chapter 43 verses 10 to 11 you are my witnesses declares the lord and my servant whom i have chosen so that you may know and believe me and understand that i am he Before me there was no god formed and there will be none after me I even I am the lord and there is no savior beside me This is Jesus the god the eternal god the creator god and Paul is emphasizing this because he wants to point it out that it was from this point from where the lord's humiliation began that he is by nature in the form of god fully god truly god he has always been and he always will be god and he is also our savior and that leads us to the second step the humility in the mind paul says that though he was god he did not regard equality with god a thing to be grasped You know Paul is saying that he was equal with God but he did not hold tightly to that equality. And brothers and sisters this is where the incarnation started in his own divine mind that he will not hold on to or cling to all that is rightfully his as the eternal son of God. He will not cling to all of that but he is going to let go of all of that. You know he did not say when he came to earth do you know who i am i am the son of the most high give me some respect and honor no 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 but he let go of all of that 
how many of us would actually be that way if we were god even now many of us are using our power and our titles to look down on others and make others feel small but here is our god you know he's all powerful he's almighty but he became small and then the third step he made himself as nothing paul says the lord did not regard equality with god a thing to be grasped but emptied himself he emptied himself of those things which were his by virtue of being god what is paul trying to say here you know he's saying that he completely renounced and refused to cling to the things that were rightly his as being god now listen listen to this very carefully this isn't to say that his nature changed when he became a man no he is the same yesterday today and forever so nothing in his nature was altered no he didn't become less than god or you know half god and half man no when paul is saying that he emptied himself it did not remove one single iota of divinity or his deity from him no he did not exchange deity for humanity this is not a kind of subtraction here no the apostles and the church fathers have always taught that the lord jesus was vera homo vera deus which means truly god and truly man fully god and fully man so what did he empty himself of well the scripture is very clear on that you know these are the things that the scripture says okay first and foremost he emptied himself of his heavenly glory you know can you imagine the eternal son of god the creator of the entire universe with full omniscience omnipresence omnipotence and immutability letting go of all those attributes so that he could be confined to a weak and frail human body you know in john chapter 17 verses 4 as our lord comes to the end of his time on earth he says i glorified you on the earth having accomplished the work which you gave me to do now father glorify me together with yourself with the glory which i had with you before the world was you know this tells us that he gave up his glory he gave up his powerful attributes in order to take on human flesh so he gave up his heavenly glory and secondly he surrendered his authority to the father you know all through the gospel of john the lord says that i only do what the father tells me i do the father's will he prayed not my will but yours be done and it says in hebrews chapter 5 verses 8 that he learned obedience how wow. and never in all eternity he had the need to be obedient to anyone but he learned obedience by submitting to the authority of the father and that meant being obedient to suffering brothers and sisters we don't like to suffer and to you know undergo pain but jesus accepted all of this he was obedient so he gave up his heavenly glory and he surrendered his authority to the father but i think the thing that he gave up the most that was so amazing was that he gave up his relationship to his father you know because on the cross he said my god my god why have you forsaken me Brothers and sisters even before time was created the son was in a loving divine union with the father and the holy spirit but on the cross he gave up that divine union 
what a painful experience that would have been and i believe that it is because of this that the lord prayed in the garden of gethsemane my father if it is possible may this cup be taken from me yet not as i will but as you will you know he wasn't scared of the romans he wasn't scared of the crucifixion he wasn't scared of death no it was the separation from his heavenly father that was shattering his soul so he gave up the authority that was his you know as the creator of the universe and the sovereign ruler over all he gave up the ability to use his power in accordance to his own will he gave up heavenly riches vast incomprehensible possessions and privileges and he gave up a loving relationship with god to suffer under that same god's wrath and this is what it means that he emptied himself and this is a really staggering reality brothers and sisters that he had all of that and yet he emptied himself of those things while remaining fully god and that leads us to the fourth step become a slave and paul says that the lord jesus took the form of a bond servant in his incarnation he became a slave to god took on the form of a slave notice that word again the word form is used again over here you see that so it doesn't mean that he wore a slave's robe or he wore slavery like a costume no 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 he actually became a slave you know if you look at his earthly life he was always borrowing stuff from people because he didn't own anything like a slave he owned nothing he had to borrow a place to be born he had to borrow a place to lay his head he had to borrow a boat to ride in and to preach from he had to borrow a donkey when he entered into jerusalem he had to borrow a room for the passover he had to borrow a tomb to be buried in all his rights of heavenly glory he emptied himself of those and he became a slave and then the fifth step he became a man paul says and being made in the likeness of men do you see that brothers and sisters you know this is god to whom the angels minister to day and night yet for our sake he became lower than the angels why why would he do this you know the writer of hebrews says it best in hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 to 18 therefore since the children share in flesh and blood he himself likewise also partook of the same that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death that is the devil and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives for assuredly he does not give help to angels but he gives help to the descendant of abraham therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to god to make propitiation for the sins of the people for since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted man what can we say to this brothers and sisters you know how amazing is this love of god that he is willing to become one of us and let me remind you to become a man is the most humiliating thing for god you know let me explain this to you through an illustration imagine a woman of noble character you know who never did anything wrong in her life she lived a pure life very popular everyone knew her but one fine day she happened to be walking down the street where a bunch of prostitutes were being arrested by the police 
Thinking that she was one of them, they arrested this innocent woman too. And she is made to sit in the same cell as the prostitutes for the whole world to see. How do you think she would have felt? Now if you can imagine that, then you have grasped you know, a fraction of the fraction of the fraction of the fraction of how humiliating it was for the Lord Jesus to become as one of us. You know, it's like asking a man to become a worm. Humiliating. And that brings us to the sixth step. Becoming low. Paul tells us that Jesus was being made in the likeness of men. You know, that is already humiliating but it goes even further it goes even lower how low being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself so not only did he become a man but as a man he had identified himself as a slave to his father and beyond that he humbled himself again He's given up his rights. He's given up his heavenly possessions. He doesn't fight back. He doesn't argue. He doesn't debate. He doesn't demand. But he was not yet at the lowest level. He went even lower. How? By becoming obedient to the point of death. His submission to the Father took him all the way to death. Because he was, after all, the lamb that God had chosen to be sacrificed for our sin. This, brothers and sisters, is the depth of his incarnation. But it wasn't a natural death, wasn't it? No, because Paul says, even death on a cross. Now, why is he noting that? Because... Crucifixion was the most horrible, ugly, embarrassing kind of death. The most painful torture that had been invented in human history at that point. Hanging naked in front of everyone. And it was only reserved for the worst of the worst criminals and slaves. It was a kind of death that was hated by the Jews. You know, in Deuteronomy 21 verses 23, uh, the Lord says that whoever dies on a tree is cursed by God. And indeed, our Lord Jesus was cursed. He was cursed by his own father on that tree for our sake. And this, brothers and sisters, is the most ultimate form of human degradation. This is where he bore our curse on the tree, as Paul mentions in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. And this humility is actually too much for us to understand. You know, we can't grasp it. And why did he do this? He did this because he did nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. But with humility of mind, he regarded others more important than himself. He wasn't looking out for his own personal interests, but the interests of others. He did all of that. He went through all of that for us and we didn't deserve it. Oh, how unsearchable are God's judgments. How unfathomable are his ways. You know, no one could ever imagine a God that would do this. And this is the ultimate and amazing truth of the Incarnation that by going through these things, He was purchasing our salvation. But as I mentioned before, brothers and sisters, that to teach about the doctrine of the Incarnation was not Paul's point here. Why is Paul sharing these things with the Philippians? You know, Paul, by sharing these things, By sharing the example of the Lord Jesus, he is telling us, do you think that you have more rights to what you think is yours than the Lord Jesus had to what was his? What is this pride that you're holding on to? What is stopping you from becoming humble? 
you know i i don't know of a more uglier attitude than the one that would say you know i am more privileged than the son of god you know i should have what i want i should have what i expect what i demand you know there's nothing more uglier than that i mean who do you think you are you know it is true that you as a believer are part of the chosen people you know the royal priesthood a holy nation all those things but that is all because of mercy and grace right it's not something that you have earned you haven't done anything for all of that it was all grace then who are you to think that you should be treated as someone really important who are you to make demands and think that you are better than everyone else if the lord of the universe was crucified naked on a tree who are you to expect any better treatment from the world if indeed you truly belong to him no slave is greater than his master the lord said you know brothers and sisters we should be the kind of people who say that you know i have received all spiritual blessings from the lord but i deserve none of it and we should be in a hurry to humble ourselves we should be the first one to do it but we are just interested in pushing our own agendas into everything and there lies the ugliness that can be reflected you know even among christians today yes we have a special standing before the lord i agree to that yes we are god's children yes we are joint heirs with christ yes even jesus said that i have called you friends yes we all have the indwelling of the holy spirit and even the father has taken up his residence in us yes we are the living temples of god yes we are ambassadors of christ yes we are blessed with every spiritual blessing yes we are chosen predestined and adopted to be conformed to the image of christ called for eternal purpose and glory yes we are all of that but it's not inherently because of anything that we have done so who am i to assert my rights as a christian i have no rights i'm a dead person i no longer live christ lives in me every marvelous blessing every privilege that we have is a merciful gift of god's divine grace so how tragic is this then that these self-centered christians place themselves at a higher level than the lord jesus himself as if you deserve what you think you should have we are called to be humble humility is the core virtue of a christian and so paul is saying brothers and sisters this world is a divided world and he's saying that the church has also a tendency to be divided and the only way to stay united is by having a unity that is born out of love and this love is the product of selfless self-giving humility and so let this attitude be in you which was also in Christ Jesus and then how does paul end this passage oh what a glorious text this is he says for this reason also god highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name so that at the name of jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that jesus christ is lord to the glory of god the father amen amen he is exalted because of his matchless humility god has now exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name and at his name every knee will bow every tongue will confess this is our god this is our god oh how great 
is our God. Brothers and sisters, this morning, behold our God. Look unto him who is the author and the finisher of our faith. The Lamb of God, the King of Kings, the Mighty One. And this ought to be our response to this greatness of our God. As the hymn says, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Crown him with many crowns, this lamb upon the throne. That's our God, brothers and sisters. That's our God. And there is no more a beautiful reality than this. That we belong to him. Yes, we belong to him. So may we as a church live up to this passage of scripture that we've read today. Let us be humble as our Lord was humble. Let us have this attitude in us which was also in Christ Jesus. For the glory of God alone. Amen. Well, this was a passage of scripture that I wanted to preach and expound upon for a very long time, but I never felt that I was ready to do it. But I'm glad that God has given us this opportunity this morning to look into this amazing passage and to learn from it. I am a proud person. Humility doesn't come easy to me. And so while preaching on this passage today and also while preparing the sermon, I was reminded that I ought to preach this to myself also. I hope that this sermon was an encouragement for you. It was something that convicted you and uh, helps you to come more closer to God. If it was helpful, please share what you've learned uh, with your disciples or with uh, brothers and sisters whom you're close to and have a dialogue about this passage of scripture with them and how it affects your life today. Now, before we end the podcast for today, let's have a final song and I'll be seeing you next Sunday, same time, same place, right here on YouTube. Until then, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you. Amen. Dashing through the snow in a one horse open sleigh, over the fields we go, laughing all the way. Bells on bobtails ring, making spirit rise. What fun it is to ride and sing the sleigh song tonight! Hey, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one horse open sleigh! Hey, jingle bells, jingle bells. All the way, oh, what fun it is to ride in a one horse open sleigh. One more time, dashing through the snow in a one horse open sleigh. All the fields we go, laughing all the way. Ho, ho, ho. Bells on bobtails ring, making spirits rise. What fun it is to ride and sing the sleigh song tonight. Hey, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh Hey, jingle bells